Christopher, you're going to have to tell me where you find those. Uh, oh, no, it wasn't you. It was Mike Flynn. Never mind. I was going to say somebody said about the chocolate covered gummy bears, but you are not oh, a gummy yeah, bear no. fan. No, 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 no. I, wrong. Yeah, you're barking up the wrong tree there, Lara. Uh, for <laughs> so those, who are, for those who are not in the know about uh, current opinions on gummy bears, uh, Sarah Cabin, I'm not sure if that's how she says her last name has been running a March Madness in lieu of basketball uh, organized around candy on Twitter. And I tune in every once in a while to the goings on and was uh, shocked, shocked to learn recently that somehow gummy bears were still in this thing, uh, which I expressed uh, in no uncertain terms on Twitter. And a gummy bear Twitter is strong, uh, robust, and well-populated. So evidently there are chocolate covered gummy bears, which are even better than regular gummy bears, but chocolate is better than regular gummy bears. So I'm not sure why, why we're getting the gummy bears into the mix there. Uh, so welcome. Uh, it is 2.30 somewhere here. I was just thinking about time zones uh, and trying to tell various people about uh, today about what time the webinar was. And I looked up at my clock, which says 1.30. And I got very disoriented for just a moment, but this clock is uh, really difficult. It requires a screwdriver to change, so it's still on uh, standard time. So it's 2.30 here uh, in the Central Time Zone in St. Paul, Minnesota. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, aye, aye, aye. Uh, these are not ordinary circumstances. They're definitely not ideal circumstances. Uh, I haven't, uh, I've had a lot of thoughts, but haven't done a lot of um, sharing of things in some of the normal places that I uh, would. On like Twitter, I haven't written on the blogs at all. I just started a um, Talking Math with Your Kids newsletter um, that I haven't written on in a few weeks um, because I feel like we are currently in an environment where very understandably people have a deep, deep hunger for resources for starting to do a thing that you haven't had to do maybe ever. Um, and certainly not at the scale and over the time frame and with the kind of planning um, that people are required uh, to at this point. And so I feel like the things that I typically have to offer are not have not in the, the first few days of people just trying to figure out how they're going to manage in new work environment have not been uh, maybe super helpful things to share. Um, and then uh, Stephanie came knocking last week and said, hey, uh, we're doing these webinars. You want to do one? And I was a little reluctant and shared what I've just shared with you. Um, but she said, nah, nah, do whatever. Just as long as there's something useful for teachers to take away uh, in the current work that they're doing. So uh, we do have that. Um, I also want, just want to launch into our work today with a little bit of uh, empathy, again, a little bit more empathy for uh, classroom teachers. I don't think, I'm not currently in a classroom and I don't think teachers have, ever been under the kind of uh, scrutiny and critique around the work that they are being asked to do, that they're trying to figure out how to do, that they're being forced to do, as I've seen in the last couple of weeks. If you've been tuned into social media at all, um, it does not at all seem like uh, an ideal time. And I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of empathy and respect and patience for both teachers and parents trying to make all of this stuff work for kids of all ages. So much appreciation for the work that you're doing, much appreciation for coming out and uh, having a little lighthearted, um, but serious math fun um, on the internet with me and Stephanie together today. So uh, a couple, um, just, just one thing I wanted to mention is that I do have the chat window open here, but I have learned in previous things that I've done that I'm not really any good at paying attention to multiple things at the same time. So uh, feel free to, um, to to launch in, to unmute yourself and say that you've got a question. Um, and also feel free to put stuff into the chat window because that is uh, Stephanie's main role here is to kind of keep a uh, keep an eye on um, that and alert me if there's anything that I need to know. Such as like, you know, uh, hey, Christopher, your audio's still muted or that kind of thing. Um, I'm sure none of you as Zoom and Google Hangout pros have ever been in that situation, but I sure have. 
Uh, so goals for the session. Oh, today, um, I'll tell you about in just a moment, but uh, maybe you, like uh, we in our house, have watched a little bit of uh, television, whether broadcast or streaming in the past few days. So I thought we'd just open up with, um, what are you watching right now? If you could throw something into the chat window. Uh, if, if what you're watching is nothing, uh, because you're all books all the time right now, by all means, tell us what you're reading. Um, I'd be curious, because uh, we're going to we're gonna run out of things around our house pretty soon, of things that we're, we're enjoying. So share with us what you've got. Great British Bake Off, nice. I was reading, uh, took a moment on Facebook this morning. Don't spend a lot of time there these days. It's a very depressing place for me, but uh, people were uh, sharing cookie recipes, chocolate chip cookie recipes. And way down deep in the comments on one of them, was a new recipe and the person was emphasizing the importance of pre-roasting the sugar that goes into these cookies. And I thought that is a level of detail that I have never, ever heard of. Babies and Netflix babies. I could be into that. I don't know anything about that. Uh, oh, I'm watching, our, my wife and I are watching um, Little Fires Everywhere, which I have to recommend. It's on Hulu. The book was amazing. I love Celeste Ang and the previous book that she wrote. Um, I devoured both of them. And the series is very faithful to the book and uh, you should definitely, definitely get out there and enjoy. Altered Carbon, there's a lot of stuff. I have to go back through this. There's a lot of stuff that I am not uh, familiar with. Robert Hawk, tell us what book you wrote. Hey everybody, first of all, this is amazing. Nice to see everybody. Second, the, I promise it's not a plug, uh, but I wrote a book about uh, for Americans who would like to improve their Spanish pronunciation. It's a passion of mine. It's study abroad from home. That is awesome. And I need your book because my son's in a bilingual program and we don't have school right now. And mommy does not speak Spanish and it's really hard to help with Spanish homework right now. Oh my gosh, so well, so all right, this is now an official plug, thanks. <laughs> yes, plug it uh, for a link in the chat. Yeah, I'll do that. We, we yes, need and stuff. I've we also got to jump in here and say, because there's so many great things now that I need to go watch, thank you everyone. Um, we will save this chat window and we'll go ahead and post online with the agenda later on today. Cool. And the recording also goes up at some point, is that right? The recordings are about a week behind because we okay. take the recordings and we also make sure to get them closed captioned before publishing them online. Nice. All right. Uh, thank you all. This is what we're watching. And we're going to uh, do a, our, our, oh, so our goals for the session. I don't think I have them on there, but I do have them on the agenda. I don't have them on slides. Two goals. One is uh, we're going to use three techniques for collecting and sharing information with a remote class. So if students are not all in the same place, uh, I think they, a couple of them are things that you could also do if students were in the same place, but your students aren't all going to be in the same place for a while. So uh, we'll do three techniques for that. Um, but that'll all be in service of um, doing some fun mathematics. And uh, the other thing I want you to walk away with is some resources for a playful instructional uh, routine that I've been working on. Um, and I would love for you all to uh, use Report Back, um, help me improve. Um, but mostly it'll just be us having some, some mathematical conversation by way of the technology together today. So uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to type your answer to that question in a chat box. It's either going to be the letter A or the letter B. But don't press return until I count to three. You got me? So you've got it there. We'll pause for a moment. We'll get everybody. You don't know, you don't know what you're typing yet. You're just going to type your A or your B. Wait till it counts three, so we all get it together so nobody's influenced by anybody else, right? It's kind of the equivalent of, you know, holding up our Plickers cards or something. Uh, so here we go. Uh, which definition of trapezoid do you prefer? Do you prefer uh, definition A, trapezoid is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of parallel sides? Or uh, B, quadrilateral with at least one pair of parallel sides? And if uh, we have any British English speakers just replace trapezium with the word uh, trap the word trapezoid in that sentence. Okay, you've made your choice. Are we ready? One, two, three. Yeah. Ooh, a lot of A's. Some B's. 
Ooh, Robert Hawk, definition A for life. Uh, yeah, so it looks like the A's are taking it, uh, but there are plenty of B's in there. Um, it has been, uh, one of the things that has been, this is a, a question that has come up lots of times in my own, my own teaching career. Uh, and one of the things that is interesting to me is that I understand like the, the state of Pennsylvania legislates, like it's in their standards, which are written into their laws, that a, uh, that a trapezoid is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of parallel sides. And that just seems absurd to me that like we're gonna legislate uh, the definition of a mathematical object. But the, the thing that has been super interesting to me um, is how people's minds interact with these definitions. Like, is it, how uncomfortable do we get with the idea that somebody else is operating with a different definition of trapezoid is an interesting question. But um, also like what, for me, what's really interesting is what underlies that, that discomfort. Or uh, are, you, are you a person who, like me, is perfectly happy to live in either one of these worlds or even both of these worlds um, simultaneously. So opening question is just an example of a place where the definition that we choose is going to have consequences, right? So if I choose the definition that a trapezoid is a quadrilateral with at least one pair, if I choose B, then different things are true in my geometric world than are true in your geometric world. The kind of work I have to do if I'm gonna prove something is different in my world than in your world. But I can, as long as we understand the, the choices that we've made, I can step over into your world and you can step over into mine. They're both equally valid worlds. It's just maybe which one we, we prefer to, to live within. Um, so definitions. And the work we're gonna to do today, uh, I promised you both trapezoids and vehicles. We've done with trapezoids for now. Uh, we'll get to vehicles, but I wanna sort of situate it in, in some of the other work that may be familiar to you by this point uh, in your interactions online with teachers. Um, so which one doesn't belong is, again, Robert's plugging his book, I gotta plug mine. Uh, which one doesn't belong? Uh, book that I wrote uh, through Stenhouse um, about five years ago now, I think, is when it, uh, we were first really working on that, along with the teacher guide. There's a lot, tons of resources. If it's something you're not familiar with, um, by all means, get in touch and I will open up a new world for you. Um, and, but for me, it, it's used for lots of things. For me, it originated in trying to think about uh, how to bring properties of geometric objects into, um, into play in classrooms that uh, lots of times those properties are sort of offered up as being static and predetermined. And I wanted there to be a way for us to have conversations about those properties, which one doesn't belong. So for me, as a tool about proper, for, for instructional routine to open up conversations about properties of geometric objects. Uh, then along came How Many, which was a similar sort of uh, open-ended kind of conversation creator, but this time around counting and units. Uh, and most recently, for about the past nine months or so, have been working um, with this newer routine in which instead of the question being which one doesn't belong or how many, uh, the question is, is it or not? And just like with the other routines, there's more than one correct answer. Yes and no are often both very valid answers to uh, that question with each of the examples that we look at. Um, and just like the other routines, the more people we have participating in the conversation, the more opportunities there are for viewing uh, things. We'll learn more because we'll have more perspectives. Um, lots of uh, mathematics is in textbooks is constructed in such a way that no matter how many people we have in the classroom, we always get the same answer. Um, these are books and ideas that are constructed so that the more people we have, the more ideas uh, we generate, the more answers we'll get. So, uh, is it or not is the game we're going to play, and we're going to play it around um, around vehicles. So. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to give you a class code that will take you to a Desmos activity where you will be both paused and paced. Um, and the goal is going to be for us to get you oriented, and then we'll walk through and have ourselves a conversation. Stephanie, can you, while I'm uh, pausing and pacing and getting everybody set up there, can you just take a quick peek and see how many people we have together today? 
There are 28 of us on today's call. Nice. Thank you. So I'm going to restrict us to screen one. I'm going to pause us and then uh, get us back to, there's the codes. And Stephanie has also dropped the code into the chat window, XS2CA3. In fact, I can grab this and throw in the chat window and it'll just be a click away. Oops, I sent that privately to Stephanie. <laughs> there we go. One click, get you where you need to go. So the way this is set up is uh, this is a Desmos activity that is uh, developed around a book that I've been playing with. Uh, the origins of this book are with um, the fabulous Cassia Wedekind, and in particular her daughter Lulu, who is six years old and who last summer uh, was arguing with her mother about whether an elevator is a vehicle. And so they were in some kind of situation where they were going to take an elevator. They'd had this conversation. Lulu went running ahead, held the door open and said, Mom, hurry up. You don't want to miss the vehicle, which then led to ongoing conversation. Um, and so that led me to wonder about uh, what other things are vehicles or are not vehicles. And in particular, the things that, that the space that's really interesting and fun for me is the uh, places where some people are likely to say, yes, that's a vehicle. And some, some people are likely to say no. So that turned into uh, the first draft of a book, which if you then know anything about me, uh, I spent 12 days at Math on a Stick last summer which is a playful math event I uh, helped to develop and run at the Minnesota State Fair. So I had Minnesota State Fair attracts 2 million people over the course of 12 days. Not all of them come through math on a stick, but some, even some significant fraction of them do. That's a lot of people. Had lots, dozens and dozens and dozens of conversations about vehicles that led to a second draft. And uh, I'll send you a link to where you can grab that paper version if that's a thing that you would like to play with in your own home. Um, but also turned it into a Desmos version. So these examples have been, have been pretty well uh, polished at, as we work our way through in order to create a, a sort of structure that uh, um, has, seems like it is really useful. And so I'll just tell you quickly the structure and you'll see how it plays out. Structure is we will see early on some things that are easy to say yes to. Yep, that's a vehicle for sure. And some things that are easy to say no to. Nope, that's definitely not a vehicle. But even with those things that's easy for most of us to say yes to or easy for most of us to say no to, we need to remember that there will be people who will say yes to each and everything that's here. And there are people who will say no to almost everything here. So there's not just one right answer, but there are less controversial answers at the opening. Um, as we work our way through examples, we'll get to more and more controversial examples. So let me uh, un pause you. You've got your student screens handy. You're not necessarily paying attention to my screen at this point. Um, I will unpause and I'm going to be curious um, about your responses to the first thing here. We have, a, we have a dump truck. Is that a vehicle or is that not a vehicle? I'm going to uh, maybe call on some people um, who are giving interesting answers as we work our way through a few of these, um, but we'll just pause to let people decide whether that dump truck is a vehicle or not. <clears throat> if you are peering at my screen, which is still shared, you can see the results roaring in. And we see we've got pretty much everybody is on board, it seems, with um, dump truck as a vehicle. Let's move ahead to salad. Is a salad a vehicle? So I imagine we've got a lot of no's here. We've got a couple yeses. Can we, uh, is Sarah, Andy, or Deanna? Any of those three? Oops. Uh, Deanna appears to have changed her mind. She's been persuaded already. Uh, Ryan, Sarah, Andy, would any of you be willing to turn on your microphone and talk to us about uh, how you see uh, salad as vehicle? Uh, hi, uh, Andy here. Um, I see salad as a vehicle for uh, nutrients and health. Nice. Nutrients gets the nutrients into your body. I've heard other people say it's uh, the lettuce is a vehicle for uh, getting the tasty salad dressing into their bodies. 
um, and yet others who won't, aren't necessarily paying attention to the salad there, but they're paying attention to the plate or to the fork. And so if I'm asking, is, is this a vehicle uh, without necessarily specifying the salad, they uh, are often on board there. Let's go over to airplane, airplane a vehicle. Uh, let's move on to, we're not generating much interesting conversation there, so let's move on to uh, tricycle. And if I may, uh, can, I have, can I have you take a moment and think to yourself, tricycle here, not controversial in this group, very controversial. Like it's, it's a place where maybe a quarter of people tend to say no uh, when I'm talking with people out at the fair. So uh, think to yourself for a moment and then we'll have one or two people share. If somebody says no to tricycle, says tricycle's not a vehicle, what might they be thinking? How might they be thinking differently about vehicles? than you are. Still not more than 30 of us, so feel free to turn on your uh, microphone and share with us who's got something to say to us about what somebody who disagrees with you might be thinking about tricycles. So we have a few people in the chat who chimed in that it needs a motor. And so maybe if we had motor be the reason it's a vehicle, then a tricycle wouldn't fit. Yeah, motorized, it's not motorized uh, is often a thing I will hear. Uh, tricycle pulls up um, probably half dozen to a dozen different sub concepts of vehicle that are sort of lingering in people's ideas about what is and isn't a vehicle. Um, motorizing is one of them. Another is that it, it, whether it's a toy or not, right? It's a, it's a toy for kids. A vehicle is a serious thing that's used for, for particular purposes. Um, some people have ideas about vehicles having some minimum range, that a, a vehicle should at least be able to get you across state lines, and probably nobody has ever ridden a tricycle across state lines. Um, there are uh, ideas about whether you can take something with you. You should be able to Oh, and whether you get into it, you get into your car, so you should be able to get into a vehicle, but you can't get into a tricycle, you ride it. Um, moving on, how about uh, skateboard? Where do we stand on skateboard? Nice, so we're pretty unanimous on tricycle. We've got a few people who are saying yes to tricycle, but no to skateboard. And that's a very interesting person to me. So uh, Gail, Josh, Asta, can one of you speak to uh, how you see skateboard as different from tricycle? Uh, mostly, I let my four-year-old answer this one, and he distinctly said that a skateboard is not a vehicle, but I haven't gotten a clear answer yet as to why. Uh, where did he? Where did the four-year-old stand on tricycle? Tricycle a vehicle? What do you think? Is a tricycle a vehicle? Ah, gotcha. Okay, so Josh is Josh has two separate votes because it's two separate people. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Very useful. I changed. I changed my answer because of the motor. I changed the try. Uh, the uh, my English is not that good, but I changed the um, that. Before the skateboard, what was that? Uh, tricycle. Yeah, the tricycle. I changed my answer there because nice. of, I thought maybe it's the motor that's, yeah, I nice. need to think about. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so am I saying your name right, Asta? Yes, Asta. Nice, so Asta uh, was persuaded by the, by the motor argument on the tricycle and therefore uh, is also persuaded by that on the skateboard. And so then we can get into, well, what about hoverboard, right? Or um, the various permutations of electric skateboards that do in fact have motors and are those vehicles. We're not gonna pursue that right now. Let's move to some, uh, some further down the line. Is a path, path is a vehicle. Often in one-on-one -on -one conversation, I'll let you, I'll talk while you vote here, maybe you'll be persuaded. Uh, often in one-on-one -on -one conversation, people will have said something by this point about how a vehicle is a thing that gets you from one place to another. Um, path gets you from one place to another. 
seems like it's a resounding no in this, no group. In this group. Uh, where, uh, are we, where are we with elevator? Elevator. Ooh. Is an elevator a vehicle? I thought of vehicle in the beginning of going from uh, where you have uh, tires and the tires move you from one place to another, but now I'm in the trouble of this, this motors. <laughs> yeah, so as we, as we get deeper and deeper into this collection of uh, vehicles or not vehicles, uh, it, the collection has been curated to start to press on some additional of these ideas. So um, certainly, yeah, does it have wheels and tires that are in contact with the ground? Elevator doesn't have that, if that's an important aspect of vehicle. Some people will then, with one of the, the beautiful parts of an is it or not conversation um, in, uh, is when somebody realizes that they're about to make a commitment or have just made a commitment that has consequences for things that they said previously. So I might say, I might now agree with Asta about, about yeah, it should have wheels. So then I think back to airplanes. Well, that airplane had wheels, but what about what about float planes, right? The planes that can land on water. They don't have wheels, they have, they have floats on the bottom. So now I'm wrestling with how much do the wheels actually matter. Other people with elevators uh, think that elevators should be able, uh, a vehicle should be able to take you anywhere on the surface of the earth, whereas elevators are just going straight up and down. Um, there are ideas about how many different places you can go. So elevator you know, only has 13, 15, two, three, like has some finite number of possible, unlike your car, some finite number of possible destinations. Uh, that then often leads to questions about subway trains. Like there is a, there is a, a subway line in Manhattan that just goes back and forth, it's cross town, goes back and forth between two, uh, between two stops. So does that, is that somehow not a vehicle just because it doesn't have enough stops? Um, lots of good times to be had here. Uh, a lot of controversy comes up with this next one. <clears throat> is a horse. It's a horse a vehicle. No wheels, right? So Asta was concerned about tires. Doesn't have those. Uh, for some people, it matters whether the horse has a saddle. That an, an unsaddled horse is not a vehicle, but as soon as you put the saddle on, now it's a vehicle because its purpose is to take you somewhere. Uh, for other people, it's not the horse that's the vehicle, it's the saddle. And a lot of people just have a flat out no living things clause. No living things will ever be vehicles, uh, not even if they show up in anime films. Uh, here's my favorite, broken down bus with no wheels. The junkyard bus was a vehicle, but that's not the question. The question is, is it now a vehicle? A lot of no's. Can we hear from uh, either Emily or Sarah who are saying yes to the vehicle? Or Lara, Christy, Asta are all in. Asta, no wheels. There's no tires on that thing. So I'm not Asta, but um, I was going to type in the box, I want a third button that says it was at one time, but you <laughs> kind of pushed back on that already. So I'm going to say once a vehicle, always a vehicle. Nice. Once a vehicle, always a vehicle. <laughs> it's the yeah. same for me. So, so Christy, uh, once a vehicle, always a vehicle. It's broken down. It's in the, it's in the junkyard. No wheels. Um, next step is it goes through the vehicle shredder, then gets melted down uh -huh. and formed into a statue. Is that statue a vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> Can I add two cents worth in here? Absolutely. Um, if you want to say now, is that now a vehicle? And that should be in the question. So to me, it is a vehicle because when it used, served its useful purpose, it could transport, it could move, it could do all those things, but you haven't got now in the question. 
<laughs> nice. I only have present tense, right? Is nice. And so as soon as it's no longer a bus, it's no longer a vehicle. And once it goes through the shredder, it's no longer a bus. <clears throat> and yes, yeah, I still, would change my mind. Yeah, I think it's still a vehicle because like when other things like, I guess this isn't dead, but like if you have a living thing that dies, like if you have a plant that's dead, you still call it a plant until it's no longer in its like form of being recognized as a plant. So it's a bus <laughs> until you can't recognize it as a bus anymore. Right. So, so after I've melted it down, I'm going to turn it into a sculpture of a bus. Then it's still a vehicle. But if I, if I don't, then it's not. So uh, one of the things that has been a, a lot of fun, I've learned uh, a lot through these conversations, both about how people think about, about vehicles. I obviously have a very now deep knowledge of the psychology of vehicle definitions. Um, but the other thing that I have learned to do is to not really care. Uh, I am perfectly happy, and it, it, it turned out to be kind of a difficult place to get to, but I'm there now, perfectly happy to live in a world where uh, once a vehicle, always a vehicle, no matter how far it goes. Like, I, I will gladly argue that if I'm in a classroom full or having a conversation with a bunch of people who uh, are taking the opposite stance. And I'm perfectly happy to say, no, come on now. It's, of course it's not a vehicle. If, you, if your car broke down, you're walking down the road thinking, I need to find a vehicle, you come across this broken down bus with no wheels. Problem not solved. You have not found a vehicle, right? I'm perfectly happy to live in any of those worlds. And I think that um, is probably going to translate into some useful skills and other aspects of my life. Christopher, uh, we're almost, yep, yep, yep. I'm curious how far down the road you were prepared to go with your bus. Like you had it all shredded up and melted down into a statue. If I still said it was a vehicle, did you have a, another scenario? Oh, right. yeah. No, I think, I think I'm out of moves. Okay. If you're still, if it's still a vehicle for you at that point, okay. I don't think I've got anything left. Do you have ideas for me? I don't. If all I right. come up with some, I'll let you know. Yeah, please do. Uh, conveyor belt. Conveyor belt a vehicle. Sometimes people say, uh, say yes because it takes things from one place to another. Uh, sometimes people say no because um, it's not transporting human beings or because uh, they think of the conveyor belt as being a, an entire system and that system stays put. Um, much like the subway system itself stays put and it's only the constituent parts that move around. Uh, lots of fun to be had with conveyor belts. Um, a lot of times people will say no, yeah, because it's, it's not human beings it's transporting. That then takes me back to uh, baggage carousels, which are essentially conveyor belts for suitcases. But then there was, um, I think it was about a year ago, there was a video uh, being shared of a two-year-old who crawled onto a Southwest uh, Airlines baggage carousel and went for a ride. Not safe, but did the, did the conveyor belt because it was then transporting a human being. Did it become a vehicle in that instant? Uh, and then once a vehicle, always a vehicle now, if a person has ever ridden on it, um, is it a vehicle? These are the, the kinds of questions we can ask. Um, can I ask a question real quick? Please? Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that um, one of the pushbacks was that this was a system built to transport one thing from another. So because it has that intent purpose, some people say it's not a vehicle. But I think about more abstract, our digestive system. That is a system that a vehicle by which we get nutrients throughout our body that starts from your mouth and goes all through. So that is a system that we come with um, that's already built and it serves a purpose and it's a vehicle in my ways. Nice. So your intestines are a vehicle. Yes. Nice. Beautiful. So that would be a lovely thing to, to type into our, uh, onto the, uh, student.desmos window now, because now we're on uh, what else? What else can you think of that might or might not be a vehicle? Um, we've got the earth, a chair, ooh, a chair. Uh, rides in a theme park. Um, yeah, Ferris wheels are super interesting as whether they're vehicles or not, because if you've got your, this idea that you're being transported from one place to another, a Ferris wheel doesn't really do that. You get off at the same place that you got on. Mm -hmm. um, so is that a thing that should count? Yeah, telephone lines. So they're transmitting ideas from one place to another. The internet would be an example. Um, skis, yeah, skis and snowboard uh, has been offered up uh, here. And I was in a conversation last summer with somebody who was uh, felt like skis 
are basically just long shoes. And so skis are not vehicle, uh, vehicles, they're apparel. But snowboard is a thing that you get onto. So then we were wondering about, well, what if you like take a board and hammer the two skis together? Like, does that, do they now become a vehicle? So that, that playing around with like, where are the limits, um, I think is a, a really interesting uh, oh, nice. and fun sort of game that naturally arises with um, a group of people uh, talking about this, this idea of does it fit into a definition that we haven't really stated what our definition is, but we kind of walk around with an idea, you know what vehicles are, right? We can tell vehicles from non-vehicles. We've read books with children about vehicles. Um, but until we've thought hard about edge cases, we've not really considered um, how robust our definition, our definition is. Uh, let me unpaste so that if you ever want to come back and play around, you're welcome to do that as a student. But there's also, um, we'll get, make sure we share again the um, link to the agenda in which there's a link to uh, the teacher version um, so that you can run this activity yourself. Uh, let me show you real quick um, another version of this. So uh, the version that we just did was facilitated by me. So the information we were collecting from all of you is something I shared with you through the dashboard and through talking with you about it. So we did this activity in real time. Um, and it's also a little bit more phone friendly than the version I'm going to show you. If, if what you're doing is on a phone, all you have is the picture and the uh, multiple choice and then maybe some typing. We're not trying to cram a bunch of stuff in. Uh, this next version is maybe something that we could do in uh, not real time, so asynchronously, uh, but it has a feature built in that makes it a little bit less um, simple to run on a phone. So if you're back on uh, your Zoom window, you should be able to see my screen. And again, we see as a dump truck a vehicle. I'm looking at it from as though I were a student participating. And as soon as I take my vote and I say, yes, absolutely, dump truck is a vehicle, then survey results are built in here. So we're able to see that um, looks like everybody has agreed with me. Uh, so far, I get to salad, to salad a vehicle. Well, of course not. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody said yes? Interesting. So maybe that's the thing that's going to prompt me to want to type something in here. These survey results, because they're squished down on a phone, um, don't come through quite as nicely as they do on a larger device. Uh, we can work our way through. Um, and I think some of these, uh, like there's a here, there's a place where if we're in real time, we'll have this conversation together. But if we're asynchronous, maybe I want to um, ask that same question. Um, not in uh, real time, because I'm not able to do that. So maybe I'll build a screen for that. So again, that one also is linked in the agenda. Uh, in the end, I have to tell you this, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you walk away thinking of being convinced that a tricycle is a vehicle or not a vehicle. It's not just like with which one doesn't belong. It, it's okay if uh, you are able to see from my perspective that the one on the upper right is the one that shouldn't belong. Um, but really deep in your soul, you believe it's the one in the lower left. Uh, same deal here. This is an exercise in our being able to uh, reflect on and think about our own ways of thinking about objects here, here vehicles, but uh, applicable to other math, to mathematical objects as well. And to think about the consequences of different kinds of definitions. If somebody has told me, like uh, Asta did, that a vehicle should have tires, then I can think to myself, what would Asta say about whether a horse is a vehicle? What would she say about whether a conveyor belt is a vehicle? Um, and that, that is a, a, a great exercise, both for um, mental flexibility, but also for being able to more carefully examine and consider the mathematical definitions that are so important in the discipline. So that would be our, just to make sure we're concrete about hitting the goal, our goals. Uh, I wanted you to walk away having uh, been through three techniques for collecting and sharing information with people who are remote, not all in the same physical space. And so we had our typing something into a chat window and then hitting return all at the same time, being able to read it in the chat window. We had um, facilitation through the dashboard. You were able to see my dashboard. Um, I was able to talk about it because we were interacting in real time. And then the survey that is built, um, survey results that are built into uh, the student version um, 
or the, the uh, yeah, the student version of the second version of is it or not vehicles, the Desmos activity. If you're interested in uh, how the mechanics of those survey results work, um, then you will want to uh, copy and edit the activity, dig into the computation layer that runs it, um, code that runs it. It's not super complicated, but if you're uh, new to that programming language in Desmos activities, um, we have folks around who are uh, super competent and have uh, time assigned to help people play around with those things. So don't hesitate to reach out to John and Jay. Information about that is linked uh, both in the agenda and on our um, play page about uh, our coronavirus distance learning um, ideas here at Desmos. Before we leave vehicles, any uh, final comments or questions? And then we'll um, dig into a couple of iterations of these ideas, tell you where to find them, and uh, do uh, overall Q&A. Any I have a I have a question. Absolutely. Um, like with vehicles, you were saying like ultimately you don't care if we like settle on a definition, uh, mm -hmm. you know, about a, is a tricycle uh, a vehicle or not. What about with like the trapezoid, or maybe not the trapezoid, but a triangle, or something like less debated upon? Do you I'd like do you feel strongly about settling on answers with that? Uh, the thing I feel strongly about is our living with two things I feel strongly about. One of them is understanding that mathematics is driven by living with the consequences, the logical consequences of the choices that you make. And I think um, reading recommendation for folks, um, Eugenia Cheng, C-H-E-N-G, has written a couple of lovely books. Um, and one of them, take me a moment to remember which one builds this argument. But the argument is that uh, there aren't really there aren't really very many actual mistakes that people make in mathematics. Every time you write something down, you're essentially putting forth uh, either a theorem, a conjecture, or uh, uh, some kind of um, some kind of postulate or rule axiom rule with which we're going to reason. And so, if you write down that one equals zero, uh, fine. Now let's go see if that's true then let's go see what mathematics you can do with it. And it turns out that if you're gonna have one be equal to zero, you can't do very much mathematics. And so it's not very interesting. So she likes to take those kinds of things or you know, if people are canceling out sine, uh, I have sine of X over sine of X plus cosine of X and I cancel out my signs. Uh, so I'm left with one over cosine of X. Okay, if, if that's true, then what else must be true? Like let's explore the consequences. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful uh, perspective. Um, the other thing I think is important is that people walk away understanding what the conventional uh, definitions are, right? So if if we've had this beautiful debate about triangles and whether whether we're going to allow uh, curvy sided triangles, and we're going to do mathematics that involves curvy sided triangles, it seems to me irresponsible for me to send you on to a tenth grade geometry teacher uh, without understanding that that tenth grade geometry teacher is going to expect that triangles have only straight sides. Um, but I think if, if we are developing deep, rich conversations about the consequences of our mathematical activities, then it's not gonna be a, um, a huge stretch to say, okay, in this context, here's what's true, as long as we continue to be explicit about that, both in the work that we do and um, future teachers in the work that they do. Um, that's where I'm with it. But I do, I do struggle with that. Uh, not least in raising my own children. I have 13 and a 15 year old child. Uh, and um, talk about uh, decisions you make having consequences, holy cow. Things that you know, we said to them when they were eight, come back at you. Um, and I try to remember that it's the long, it's the long game, both with children and with uh, raising children and with students. Um, okay, so a couple uh, things to wrap up. Um, is or not vehicles, like that particular activity, I've got three forms for you. Uh, one is the no feedback in the activity works well on phones, that's the one we did, the one with the bar graphs. Um, and there's also a, uh, the current version of the book, which you're free to download and print. There's a link in the agenda. Um, 
and you can download it from, that'll take you to a website, download it from that link. Please, by all means, share that link widely. Don't share the file itself. The goal is that someday that's gonna be a published book. Um, and if there are millions of these circulating on email and, and Reddit and whatnot, um, that will cause problems with publishers later on. But uh, by all means, share the link, download it for yourself, um, print out as many copies as you like, put them in little free libraries. Uh, the conversations that I've had around it are wonderful and I'd love the idea of there being as many of those conversations happening um, in as many places as possible. If you do uh, print out, print one out, just uh, read the directions carefully um, because it's, it is uh, formatted so that if you, you print it out back, front and back in just such a way that it all folds together and makes a nice neat book. And it's super confusing if something goes wrong in that process. Uh, what are your next steps uh, after having spent 45 minutes to an hour uh, talking about um, books that or shows that you're watching, definitions of trapezoids and vehicles? Um, play with those activities, go in, run them, uh, by all means, have fun with them. There is also, and I'm pretty sure this is linked in the agenda, let me know if it's not, um, a version I built around functions. Uh, is it or not functions? And uh, all of these prototypes that I've been playing with all start with something that is like a clear example in everybody's mind of a, func of a thing, here a function, and a clear example of something that's not. Um, we at Desmos have a weekly meeting uh, of all of the people that we refer to as being on the teaching faculty. So all the, the folks with teaching backgrounds and who do the bulk of the curriculum writing work. And we rotate responsibilities for everybody to lead some sort of educational experience for all of the others. It might be a problem we're working on, uh, some research we've done. I often uh, will bring, you know, whatever is super interesting to me at the moment. And so we did is it or not functions together. And one of my proudest moments of all time was, um, when after doing this, uh, like half an hour later, Dan Meyer was still frustrated over even having been asked the question, is a chair a function? That was deeply disturbing to him and I'm, I'm very proud to have been the cause of that. Um, so you go play with is it or not functions, that'll give you an idea of what this might, how this game might play out um, with more mathematically focused objects. Um, download the book, uh, maybe you wanna build one yourself. Uh, sandwiches. I happen to know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of fun to be had in asking what is what are the, the boundaries of what constitutes a sandwich. Um, I have drafts, but nothing that's ready to share yet of versions that involve shapes. Um, and for example, the letter A is the le is is a letter a shape. Uh, and words, words have been a lot of fun. Um, vehicles don't tend to have a generational divide. Uh, I don't know what kind of test we're doing when we when people are saying yes or no to tricycle. Like I think we're learning something about people, but I'm not sure what. But uh, some of the word examples are clearly generational. So uh, one of the edge cases in the words prototype I've played around with is an emoji. It's the heart eyes emoji, and adults, people thirty and over, uh, are are pretty uncomfortable with calling an emoji a word. Fourth graders. Holy cow, absolutely, 100%, that's a word. Um, with their idea about word being that if it communicates, it communicates meaning. And so they'll come back with, if, if I texted you something and you texted that back to me, 100%, I'd know what you meant by it. And that's, that's for them, that's what word means. Um, uppercase I, right, it's just a letter, but it also in English is a word. What about lowercase I? And again, generational divide. Uh, younger, younger folks who've grown up with texting, no problem. Uh, us folks who didn't grow up with texting as, as the way that we learned and, and thought about words, um, more of a problem. All these links are in the agenda. Uh, if there's anything that you saw in the activity or you've got ideas about things uh, not even related to this, um, John uh, Rowe, who is in Australia, Jay Chow, who is in Hawaii, um, both are running activity clinics on a regular basis, information at learn.desmos.com. And uh, they have been super supportive, doing a lot of really um, fun and interesting work, um, helping teachers bring their ideas, particularly right now with um, the, the constraints that all of us are, are working with. Um, they've done a lot of really great work to support teachers in building things that they wanna 
that they could do with their students. Uh, do you, Stephanie, want to say if, anything about upcoming webinars, recordings, and more, and then we'll head into Q&A? Sure. Um, we have three of our webinars posted right now, the distance learning webinar, card sorts, and starter activities. It is my personal goal to get two more up by the end of the week. And I will say by the end of the week, I'm talking end of the day, Saturday, not Friday. Um, I think we're going to get them back Friday night. Um, it's taking Zoom a little while to get those back to us just because everybody's on Zoom right now. And so Zoom's a little experiencing some heavy server load, but we will get those up as soon as we can. Um, we have another webinar on Thursday or tomorrow on Friday. Um, and then we're sort of waiting to see what NCSM and NCTM are doing next week before making decisions going forward with future webinars. We will promise to keep that website up to date as we make decisions and let you all know what is going on. You can also find out there about the new feature releases and how to use those in your classroom with students more. Fabulous. Uh, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. And if you are uh, going on to do other things, I'll just say now, thank you so much for coming out, playing vehicles with us and letting us, letting me uh, pick, your, pick your brains about how you think about vehicles and about definitions more generally. Ah, the agenda. I've got this. Uh, let's see, it is, uh, it's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash uh, Desmos dash vehicles. So it's in the chat window there. And that's all the other links will be uh, in there too. <laughs> Christy's asking, will the book uh, that is yet to be, uh, will it only be vehicles, will it be other things too? That's yet to be negotiated. Um, my, uh, Tracy's not here, is she? My editor and friend at Stenhouse, uh, Tracy Zager, doesn't know that this is the next book. I think she thinks the next book is uh, going to be about patterns, and that's still someday going to be. But it hasn't. It it things develop on their own schedules, and this one developed quickly. Um, so I've actually been working on chapter two, which in, will follow this. The, the idea is that the teacher edition will follow the same structure as the uh, books for which one doesn't belong and for how many. And chapter two is the place where um, we, I analyze the, the mathematics and the learning of whatever the topic is, geometric properties or how children learn number. And so here it's about um, definitions. You know, what research, what do we know about how people learn definitions? How do definitions function, um, function in the field? And uh, it's, it's interesting that it's sort of backwards from how the other books have come together. That I haven't, I'm not sure whether it's going to be all vehicles or whether it's going to be some some vehicles, some sandwiches, some shapes, some words. Um, right now, this chapter doesn't, I don't need to know that yet. Well, I noticed you made the title vague enough to give yourself some breathing room there. Yeah, yeah. But the, the original thought was that it was going to start, and so I didn't actually pitch it to Stenhouse right away because it felt like a, a children's book that didn't have a teacher guide. And it was only about a month or two ago that I realized that the, that deep dive on definitions really had some some interesting things for me to learn um, and probably for teachers to learn as well. Uh, the book will be a vehicle uh, for the ideas about definitions, or will it? I don't think we know yet. Or will definitions be the vehicle for the book? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, our definitions, vehicles. <clears throat> And uh, definitely one of the things that is most rewarding for me in all of this is hearing back from, from you all when, so if I saw some people saying, can't wait to try this out with high schoolers, um, definitely had productive conversations with fourth graders around vehicles, uh, definitely hearing back from um, people who have these conversations and you notice something new, some kid has some new example, all of that is uh, deeply rewarding to me. So much appreciate reporting back. All right, looks like we're out of questions. Thank you all, friends, for uh, coming out, spending a little bit of time. I do wish you all the best. Uh, my own 
15 year old is at a project based high school where they're a little bit more accustomed to some of the, the different kinds of structures that are important right now. My 13 year old um, is in a pretty straightforward standard middle school. Um, and so they have spring break next week, but then distance learning starts in earnest and uh, they will have a very, their t her teachers will have um, a patient and supportive set of parents at home. I wish the same for all of you. Um, and uh, thank you all for the soldiering through in these, uh, these difficult and trying times. Much appreciated. You know where to find me online. Uh, I'll just put my uh, Twitter handle and email address in case you have any follow-ups after we leave here today. Those in the chat right now. All right, thanks a lot, friends. See you around. Thank you both. Thank you.